Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank, thanks for coming. Um, we're happy to be happy to host Yost de Gal uh, this afternoon for the seminar. Um, Yost got his PhD from the University, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and his first entry into Boulder was being a postdoc at Jilla. Um, he is currently a research excuse me, senior research scientist at the University of Colorado series, and, excuse me, and an adjunct professor, or adjoint professor in the Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry. His research over the past two decades has focused on the sources and chemical transformations of organic compounds in the atmosphere, the formation of ozone and secondary organic aerosol, and the impact that these processes have on air quality, climate change, and human health. So I'll turn it over to Yost. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks John. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, talk about my work on uh, VOCs uh, from the last few years, and uh, specifically focusing on uh, urban and biomass burning uh, sources. So a very brief outline. Um, I'll talk about um, a lot of the work that we did in Los Angeles. And then i uh, turn um, to uh, indoor measurements of VOCs for, for reasons that will become uh, clear, hopefully, throughout my talk. And then finally, I'll, I'll switch gears and talk about VOCs uh, from biomass burning. So why are we uh, interested in VOCs? Um, we all know that in polluted air, they contribute to the formation of ozone, organic aerosol, and also some um, VOCs can have direct health effects. So ozone and aerosol are uh, two of the key pollutants that, um, in, in, in air, and also they uh, play a role in the climate system. Um, in terms of VOCs, uh, there's been a lot of good news in the United States and, uh, and, in, and elsewhere in most developing nations. Uh, VOCs have come down a lot. This is a compilation of data um, from the Los Angeles basin that Karsten Barnecke, who's sitting in the audience, put together some years ago. And uh, what he found was that across the board, um, you have a decrease of about 7.5% per year for most anthropogenic VOCs. And this plot extends from 1960 until 2010. So that's, that's, a, that's half a century of decreases in VOC emissions. Obviously, NOx emissions have come down too a lot. Um, to illustrate, I brought this graph from, um, from the OMI instrument that NASA put together. And this is data just from 2005 until 2011, just six years. And you can clearly see the decreases in the NO2 columns. So of course, as a result, uh, ozone has been going down um, in, in most of the US, especially in the eastern part of it. This, these are the trends in ozone in uh, the springtime, where um, a blue dot means that there is a significant negative trend. And obviously, most of, most of the stations are blue in the spring and in the summer. Um, and then the uh, direction of the arrow uh, indicates the, uh, the, the magnitude of the trend. And, and if it points straight down, like here, um, you have a change, a rate of change of about a PPB per year. So both in the spring and in the summer, you have significant decreases um, in ozone, especially in the eastern US and the western US a little less. Aerosol um, manifests themselves as, as reduced visibility that it also has improved in the US. This is a photograph um, put together by our colleagues at CSU up in Fort Collins uh, using data from the improved network. And, um, of course, they make measurements in the national parks and then have reconstructed how the visibility changed between, in this case, 89 and 2008 at this location in California, and the difference is clear. So there has been significant progress, but there are also uh, many, many uh, challenges that remain. Um, our energy infrastructure uh, has changed a lot, so um, there's been a lot of research looking at the results of natural gas production in the U.S. Um, wildfires are on the rise. Obviously, we saw some major examples of that this last uh, year, I should say, not just summer, but year. Um, 
And so there's a lot of research into um, that. Um, ozone, and it looks like my, no, it's still there. Ozone from remote sources is changing. Um, I just replaced this graph a few days ago with the one that shows there are now actually some declines in, um, in uh, ozone uh, at the US West Coast coming in from remote sources. So that's good news. But it's on only very recent. And then finally, um, there are also natural emissions that um, interact with pollution and that we need to understand better. So the first topic I wanna talk about is um, the sources and chemistry of VOCs in, uh, in the Los Angeles basin. Uh, so this is all based on data that's um, by now already a little bit older, uh, the Calnex data set from 2010. And the question is this, if you're measuring in a urban air shed like this, uh, obviously some of the emissions you look at came from nearby sources and, and you'll see them um, unchanged by chemistry, basically. But um, if you sit in the middle of a basin, a lot of the emissions you look at come, come from several hours away and, and there's been chemistry in between the time of emission and in between the time of sampling. And that means that some of the more reactive hydrocarbons um, have gone away. And it means that some oxygenated products uh, may have been formed. And so the question is, can we account for the effect of chemistry and still derive the composition of the VOC emissions? And if we can do that, what are the sources of those VOCs in an urban air shed like this? So this work is, is, is presented in three papers. Um, uh, one is mine that came out last year, and uh, one's currently in press um, in JGR, and then uh, Brian McDonald, who's also here, um, has a paper coming out in science uh, uh, with some of these results. So the data uh, I'm gonna talk about were obtained on the campus of Caltech, well known to some of you here in the audience, and um, during the day, what you're looking at is mostly marine air that's advected to the site, but of course on its way it picks up a lot of emissions from uh, Los Angeles, and during the day those get aged on the way to the site. At night the winds are much lighter, so you're mostly looking at local um, emissions. So, um, we obtained a very, very detailed data set um, using a GCMS. Uh, principal investigator on that was Jessica Gilman, who's here in the audience. Um, and then, uh, very recently, um, Gabe Isaacman um, developed this new peak fitting software that made it um, a lot easier to go through these data and basically um, generate more, um, more measurements out of that data set. And Brian Lerner played a large role in, uh, in making that possible. So th these are all the species that we determined from these data set in terms of hydrocarbons and in terms of oxygenates. And for the oxygenates, I, I added a few species that weren't from the GCMS, but from other instruments. So this is the data set I'll be analyzing. And this is really a beautiful um, data set um, in the sense that you can see, you can readily see the effects of chemistry on the measurements. Um, so on the left, what I'm plotting is the, the, the average aerial variations for four aromatic hydrocarbons, um, and they're all normalized to a midnight value of one, and that just makes it easier to, uh, to compare them. And what you see is that at night, um, all species follow the same ups and downs, but then during the day, um, they um, start to di diverge, and that's because of um, OH removal of the more reactive hydrocarbons. Um, so in this case, the uh, 1 to 4 trimethylbenzene and the MP xylene are much more reactive than benzene and toluene, so that's why it breaks up during the day. For the oxygenates, you see the opposite, you see formation during the day. Um, so this gives us a nice handle on um, chemical, uh, the effect of chemistry on, on the emissions. Um, if we want to quantify things, what we can do is uh, make use of this and calculate uh, what we call an OH exposure. Um, 
So to calculate it, we use um, two hydrocarbons. One is benzene. Um, and that, after emission, will go away exponentially, where the exponent is driven by the OH rate coefficient of benzene plus OH. You can write down the same for um, trimethylbenzene. It's a much more reactive compound, and so also an exponential function, but with a much higher rate coefficient. If you take the ratio between these two equations and you solve for OH delta T, which is the OH exposure, um, you get this, this equation. So now you can calculate that using just uh, measurements and published rate coefficients. So how does that work in practice? Um, this is the diurnal variation in the measured benzene over trimethylbenzene ratio. It goes up during the day because of OH chemistry. And um, so that gives you this part of the equation. You have to assume an emission ratio. Um, I can talk for a long time about how I did that, but uh, I don't have time for that here. This is the value I, I took. And now you can calculate the OH delta T. And it's, in fact, already on the graph, but on the right axis. So it varies between 0 and 50 times 10 to the ninth. And uh, as it turns out, that's a very reasonable number. If you, if you look at a measure OH rate coefficient and a transport time of a few hours, that's exactly what you get. So what, we, what can we do with this? Um, we can use this to look at chemical changes in a quantitative way. And so what's shown here is uh, measurements for four different hydrocarbons, uh, another trimethylbenzene, propene, two-methylpropene, and transtubutene. Um, and the graphs show how they change as a function of this OH exposure. Um, so this, this works really nicely for the trimethylbenzene and the propene, but obviously there's a lot of scatter here. So before we go any further with this, uh, I want to think about that a little bit. And the reason there was this scatter is that um, for these alkenes, um, other oxidants than OH are also important. Um, so at this site, uh, we actually measured OH, and when, we, when I say we, it's the royal we. This was actually Phil Stevens from Indiana. We had measurements of NO3 from Jochen Stutz's group and measurements of ozone from Brian Leffer's group. And so having these radicals, you can calculate the loss of various hydrocarbons versus these radicals. And when you do that for pentane, xylenes, ethene, you see that there's really only one radical that matters, and that's OH. But when you look at these alkenes, you see that that's not true. Um, for instance, a compound like trans 2 Butene has significant losses from OH, larger losses from ozone, and also significant nighttime losses of NO3. And so OH uh, exposure is not going to be a very useful metric to look at the chemical changes of, uh, of these alkenes. So we have to look at something else. And, and, and what, what we tried in this paper was uh, to look at ozone exposure. Um, so it's a very similar approach. But the only change is I'm now looking at a different hydrocarbon pair um, that is sensitive to ozone chemistry. So you can already see that this diurnal variation in that hydrocarbon pair is it's very different. It's not just a peak during the day and, and nothing at night. There is, there is structure at night. Um, and then using this equation, you can, again, calculate an ozone exposure um, from this hydrocarbon pair. So now using um, um, this ozone exposure, um, you can see that, that all the scatter that we saw in the trans to beauty versus OH exposure actually um, falls away if you look at the nighttime behavior versus ozone exposure. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the variability that we see at night when there's no OH uh, can be uh, um, assigned to uh, ozone chemistry. So why are we going through this? Um, basically, we want to take chemistry out of the equation and look at the composition of the emissions. And so these are the um, um, emissions ratios that uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be looking at later on in my talk. You can do the same thing for oxygenated VOCs, but now 
uh, you have the complication that these uh, compounds are also formed as a function of, of, uh, of, of various chemistries. And so uh, what I'm showing here is three examples, formic acid, propanol, and acetaldehyde. And you can see that as a function of OH exposure, you form a lot of formic acid, you form acetaldehyde, you don't form propanol. It basically just goes away. Uh, and it is somewhat reactive with OH, so that makes sense. Um, I put the, the dependence on OH, on, sorry, on ozone exposure also on the graph already. And you can see that the dependencies on ozone at night are fairly weak. So there may be some formation at night of formic acid and maybe some of acetaldehyde, but it's hard to know um, if those are significant uh, without doing further work. So again, it's the emissions ratios that I'm, I'm going to be interested in here mostly, and I will come back to later in the talk. But before I, I want to look at those emissions in detail, I, I want to pose the question, uh, does this analysis really work? Um, <clears throat> in the real atmosphere, emissions from different sources um, are mixed. Um, these OH and ozone exposures that I calculated are really only very average uh, properties of each air mass. Each air mass has one average OH exposure. Is that even realistic? And uh, you may have other questions that uh, I invite you to <coughs> insert here for my next talk about this topic. Um, but what I decided to do is try and tackle this question um, a little bit more rigorously. And so what I did was um, I got the WARFCAM model output for Pasadena. Um, and then I analyzed the model output in the exact same way as I analyzed the measurement data. And the question I asked myself is the, the emissions that I think are in the model because of my analysis method, do they agree with what was actually put in the model? The modelers know the emissions they put in. I did not. I just looked at the model output and told them, I think you put these emissions in there. Did it match? So this is work I did together with Siwan Kim. Um, and uh, this graph compares the OH exposures and the ozone exposures between the, the measurements in the top and the model um, at the bottom. And you see a lot of the same features in both, and, and, and even quantitatively, it looks, it looks pretty good. The OH exposure um, goes up to 35 times 10 to the ninth in the measurements, and, and 40 times 10 to the ninth in the, um, in the, uh, in the model, so, so not bad. You can make these same graphs uh, from the model output, and again, you see um, for uh, xylenes, a strong dependence on OH exposure during the day and, and a weak dependence um, on ozone exposure at night. Um, for the OLI species, so these are olefins with internal bonds, very reactive, um, you see a lot of scatter as a dependence of OH exposure, and you see that it all um, converges to a nice line if you look at the nighttime model output versus ozone exposure. So this looks very similar, in fact. For the oxygenates, um, there are some interesting differences between the measurements and the models. Um, as a function of OH exposure, you see formation of formaldehyde. You see formation of ketones. You don't see much formation of aldehydes. And in fact, you see a lot of scatter here. Um, but uh, interestingly, the model has a lot of chemistry at night. So for instance, the ketones at night versus ozone exposure show a lot of increase. Um, so that's a little bit different between the model and the, um, um, and the measurements. Now, I don't have too much time to talk about the chemistry differences. But what I'm going to do is, um, is focus on, on the emissions. So um, for instance, for formaldehyde, the fit um, tells you that the emissions is, is um, um, that the emissions are are um, somewhere here, and so I'm going to compare that to what's in the model input. Um, so this is the 
the uh, analysis that I promised from the outset um, with the, um, the emissions used in WARFCAM for all these lumped species uh, in, in black and the emissions inferred from the model output uh, in red. And you see that there's, there's good agreement for the hydrocarbons, you're within 30% or so. Um, for the, the three oxygenated species on the right, uh, the agreement is not as good, it's basically a factor of two. Um, and um, there's a lot more to say about this graph. Again, I don't have too much time for that, but, um, but it's, um, it, was, it was a good result, I think. So now, now we have these emissions, we have evaluated the methods by which we obtained them. Um, what, uh, what can we do with those? And this really is, is Brian McDonald's work, who's in the back of the audience here. And so what Brian did was uh, compare these uh, VOC emissions with, with a fossil fuel emission inventory. And so each of these dots is the result for one compound. And uh, the inventories on the y-axis, the, emission, the obs observations are on the x-axis. And you can see that many hydrocarbons follow the one-to-one -one line, that's great. But there are also many species that are off the line. And the notable exceptions are alcohols, ketones, C9 to C11 alkanes, and a few others. Um, so why is that? Well, Brian took that, um, that problem head on, and he built a, a new emissions inventory for what he calls a volatile chemical product. So what are volatile chemical products? They are the chemicals that we use in our everyday lives as cleaners, personal care products, solvents, glues, paints, pesticides, etc. Um, <clears throat> so now, if you look at the product sales, um, that's just a small volume uh, compared to what we use for fuels. Um, so this, this is 4% of our hydrocarbon uh, sales, you might say. Or, um, and, uh, and this is gasoline fuel, this is natural gas that we use for heating uh, and cooking, and this is diesel fuel. So in terms of total sales, it's a small amount. But to go to emissions, you need emission factors. And <clears throat> we've made a lot of progress to make the emission factors for various um, um, motor vehicle emissions quite small. Um, that gave rise to the strong decrease in VOC concentrations that I showed early on. And this is a logarithmic scale, and, and these are emission factors for these chemical products. So they're, they're two orders of magnitude higher than what you get from a, from a gasoline vehicle. So yes, it's a small sliver of our total use, but some of it is made to evaporate. So if you look at emissions, um, the inventory actually predicts that these volatile chemical products are about half of the total emissions. Is that true? Well, Brian put that um, into um, the inventory along with the fossil fuel emissions, and now he can explain a lot more of the variability um, of the VOCs as we observed them. So a lot more species are now close to the one-to-one -one line. There are still some exceptions. Uh, for instance, the aldehydes are still poorly explained. And uh, we don't really understand why that is yet. Um, but in doing so, um, the average bias between the inventory and the measurements decreased from 39% to, is that a 1%? It's a little hard to see from this angle. <clears throat> so much better agreement overall. So what does this mean for atmospheric chemistry? Well, these are the same pie charts again, but now broken up by the uh, VOC reactivity with OH and by the SOA formation potential. So you can see that the emissions from these volatile chemical products represent uh, about half of the OH reactivity um, and, and, and a little bit more than half of the SOA formation potential. Um, so this is Brian's paper and it will be out in, uh, in a few weeks. So how do, we, how do we make further progress on, uh, on these emissions? Um, 
a, a significant fraction of these, um, cleaning products, personal care products, the emissions take place indoors. And so um, what I've been working on over the last year or so is um, to make measurements inside buildings in an effort to constrain the emissions of these volatile chemical products. So this is work that I'm doing uh, that is being led by uh, Jose Jimenez and Paul Zeman at CU and is supported by the uh, Sloan Foundation. Um, so we did a study in the Art Museum on the campus of CU. It's a relatively new building with a very well-designed HVAC system. And um, we measured there for about a month uh, in the summer of 2017. And one of the things that happened was there was a reception when the uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts uh, candidates had to exhibit their, their artwork. And um, so we made an extensive set of measurements. And this is CO2 uh, measured in the building. So when the, when the reception starts, you see that CO2 jumps up. Um, because of the uh, CO2 on people's breath. And then we also measured, uh, not just in the room, but we also measured in the duct system um, that's used to uh, circulate air through the building, um, uh, control the temperature and humidity, and also bring in a little bit of ambient air um, uh, continuously. And so the CO2 in that, in that duct system also goes up, but it goes up with a delay because because the ducts also take in air from adjacent rooms. And then when the reception's over, uh, the difference between the room and the duct system goes pretty much to zero and CO2 gets mixed out of the building. Um, so you see this nice exponential delay. So if you look at this difference between the room and the duct system, and you know the exchange of air which is all measured, you can get the emissions of CO2 in the room. And <clears throat> so you can see that the emissions during the reception went up to something like um, three kilograms per hour. We know from the museum how many people were in the room because they counted them. 150 people, everybody releases about 20 grams per hour. We do too, by the way. and. Um, and, and so you would expect, just based on the occupancy, a release of about three kilograms per hour, which is what we saw. So that's, that's a nice sanity check. And, and I should also add, this work is led by uh, Dimitrios Pagonis. He operated a PTRMS, and so you can do the same thing for a VOC like acetone. It's also on people's breath. And here is the acetone emission from people, the occupancy, so a very, very nice, um, um, correlation between occupancy and acetone emission. We find about 0.9 milligram per hour per person. The literature value is 1.1. Not everything mixes well through the building. Um, this is lactic acid that's, based, that's present in our sweat and in our breath. And um, this is lactic acid in the room where all the people were during the reception. This is lactic acid in the, in the duct system. And so what you can see is it's released in the room. It, it doesn't come out through the duct system. It gets lost somewhere. So, so what you learn from this is our buildings are covered in lactic acid. <laughs> um, and this is, uh, this is work done by, uh, by Derek Price. Um, so one question really is, um, is that loss permanent or, or does it still mix out on a longer time scale? We just don't know these things. So these are all species released from humans. Um, there were also a lot of things going on in the museum that had to do with VCPs. For instance, to prepare for this exhibit, they painted a wall uh, just to make it you know, nice and presentable for the exhibit. And, uh, and so we measured doing that. And, um, this is the, the measurement for alkanes. Um, so those are shoot up to several tens of PPBs in the room. The duct system follows with some delay. Ethylene glycol doesn't come back through the duct. So we think from these measurements that something like 5.7 grams was released just from painting that one wall, and, uh, and about five grams of that total, most of it, um, got lost on the walls. <clears throat> 
We're doing some surface uptake experiments to constrain uh, these losses. And so this is work done by Luke Algrim. And he made a little reactor uh, about shoebox size that he can put on a floor, on a wall, on a ceiling. Um, and um, he, can, he can pass clean air through it, air with oxidants, um, or also just VOCs to look at uptake. And then he measures using a PTR mass, a SIMS, and other instruments. Um, <clears throat> you have to consider what the, what the shoebox itself does to your losses. So um, he made a, um, a movable cover. And uh, if you pull it up, then, then only then you expose the, uh, the surface of interest um, to your oxidants or VOCs. So he's been using that to look at losses of VOCs on various surfaces. Um, so these are measurements where he exposes glass and, on, and here uh, paint, painted wall, to a series of ketones ranging from uh, C4 ketones to C14 ketones. And you can see that glass is not a very strong sink for these ketones. Paint, on the other hand, um, takes up a lot of these ketones. So currently, what we're trying to understand is the mechanism behind this uptake. Is it reversible? Is it not reversible? And also, what component of the paint uh, is responsible for this? Let's see, how am I doing on time? I'm not doing very well on time. No, 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 wait. I have plenty of time. Sorry, I got confused. Um, it's my projection says an hour here. But uh, I guess I turned it on well before the meeting. So, OK. Um, I'm going to switch gears completely now to, uh, to biomass burning. And um, um, clearly, um, wildfires are a major, major um, factor, driver of, of uh, poor air quality in the country. Um, this is a, a picture of the San Gabriel complex fire. Um, behind LA in, in the summer of 2016. So what is um, biomass, really? Um, well, there are a few uh, biopolymers in, in biomass that, uh, that make up most of the mass. Um, so there's cellulose on the left. That's part of the cell wall of green plants. It's about 40 to 50% of wood. Uh, there's also lignin, which, which gives the um, uh, which provides the structural strength, and, uh, and that's about 20 to 35% of wood. So this is what you're burning. So what you can see here is you see a lot of ring structures. You see uh, aromatic rings. You see uh, heterocyclic rings. You see a lot of oxygens. Um, so what you can expect in terms of VOCs is going to be rich, rich in aromatic and heterocyclic rings, high O to C ratio. Um, there's, there's been a lot of variability observed between fires. And the question then is, can we understand some of that uh, variability? So NOAA organized the fire, FireX study in 2016 um, to look at some of this um, using the best instruments uh, out there. And so this study was led by Karsten Warnecke and Jim Roberts, who are both here. And it was performed at the US Forest Service um, Fire Lab in Missoula, Montana. It's a very unique facility. You can uh, <clears throat> make um, a, you know, a pretty significant fire in the lab, uh, exhaust the smoke through the stack. And then up here, you have a measurement platform where you can, uh, where you can um, analyze the smoke. And, uh, and we did that with, with many, many different instruments. So the, in, the measurements that I'm going to focus on were obtained with this um, um, chemical ionization mass spectrometry instrument that uses H3O plus ions uh, to, to analyze. So this instrument was developed um, at the NOAA lab a few years ago by Abby Koss and Bin Yuan. And um, <clears throat> Matt Kogan, who's here, uh, was also um, one of the people who ran it um, during the fire lab. Uh, experiments in 2016. So what is this instrument? Um, it's basically like a PTR MS. Uh, you have an ion source where you make H3O plus ions. You have a reactor 
where those ions react with VOCs by proton transfer, and then you have a time of flight <clears throat> mass spectrometer um, to analyze the product ions. Um, so this allows us the detection of hundreds of VOCs at, at 10 ppt levels and up uh, at a one second time resolution. So what do you see uh, from one burn? Um, so typically what we did was uh, start with fuel um, that's very open, so it, it, it flames up pretty readily. This is, this is what it looks like after a minute and a half. After four minutes, the flames have died down and you, and you basically have some, some smoldering uh, twigs left. And, and so you see a lot of changes in the VOCs um, during an experiment like this. And, uh, but you also see a lot of differences between compounds. For instance, this is benzene and it shows some big spikes early on when you have these big flames and then it basically just dies down. This is guaiacol, <clears throat> which is a functionalized aromatic. And it basically is not very high early on, and it peaks much later. Uh, it peaks at a time when a fire looks like this. So the question we asked ourselves is, um, can we explain this variability? Well, to do that, we, uh, <coughs> we uh, asked advice from the best. This is Bob Yokelson. He's been thinking about these things for decades. And um, so, so really, what is biomass burning? Well, um, when you start to heat biomass, uh, you, you first release some species like water, like monoterpenes that are, that are basically present as pools in the, in the fuel. Um, as the temperature gets higher, you start to pyrolyze the biopolymers. Um, and at low temperature, that gives you compounds like guaiacol and syringol. Um, the VOCs that are released from the heated biomass, uh, they get combusted in the flames. The flames um, produce heat and CO2. And of course, the flames heat the biomass. Um, so now at the, at the, at the higher temperatures, the, the pyrolysis uh, leads to different emissions, things like benzene and PAHs. And then in the end, um, <clears throat> The remaining biomass gets enriched in carbon, um, and, and that can react um, exothermically with oxygen um, that leads to the glowing that you see when you look in the heart of a, um, of a uh, fire, and that leads to emissions of things like ammonia. So what we asked ourselves is, uh, can we see VOCs from these different processes uh, from our measurements using a statistical method called a positive matrix vectorization? Well, the short answer is yes, we, we can. Uh, what we can really see well is basically two factors. Uh, one that peaks early on, and that we're going to attribute to the high temperature pyrolysis factor. And then a second one that, um, that peaks later and, then, and also lingers much longer. And we're going to attribute that to a low temperature pyrolysis factor. Together, these factors can uh, explain a lot of the observed uh, signal. So this, this compares the total signal from the mass spectrometer. And this is work led by Kanako, Sekimoto, um, and Abby Koss that's just been submitted to ACP. So these are the mass spectra for um, the two factors. Uh, there's a lot of detail to look at here. We don't really have time for that. Um, the key part of it is that, um, that for every fuel, you basically get the same mass spectra. And so now, now you have something that, uh, that starts to explain some of the variability between, between um, different burns. So how do we know, how, why do we attribute these, these factors to pyrolysis? Um, there is a lot of pyrolysis literature on biomass. Um, basically, you heat up some biomass in front of a GC, and you look at the VOCs as a function of temperature in an in a, uh, anoxic environment. Um, so those results are summarized here at the bottom for biopolymers like uh, hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin. Um, this is the temperature from cooler to hotter, and you see some of the key compounds that, um, that are observed in those papers. 
So on top here are those same compounds, but now uh, we, we look at the, that the, at the factor of the total signal that we attribute to the high temperature pyrolysis and the low temperature pyrolysis for something like PAHs, for instance. Most of it is assigned to the, the high temperature, whereas for something like uh, syringol and guayacol, these functionalized aromatics, most of it is attributed um, to the low temperature pyrolysis. And that really, really agrees with the results from the literature uh, in, a in a qualitative sense. And so that allows us to, um, to make this distinction. As I said before, if you, if you do this um, analysis for different fuels, um, then you get the same mass spectra. So this compares the mass spectra of manzanita, which is, you know, I'm not a biologist, so forgive my, uh, my flippant description of manzanita, uh, a small shrubby plant versus uh, pine, we all know what pine looks like. And um, each dot here is one mass in the mass spectra, and you see that, uh, that the high temperature spectra and the low temperature spectra agree pretty well with each other for these um, fuels. How are these two factors different? Um, well, the composition is different. Uh, we've looked at that in some detail. Um, in terms of OH reactivity, um, they're actually fairly similar. They're both very reactive. Uh, but of course, the reactivity comes from different compounds in each, in each, um, for each factor because, because they are different things. Um, we also looked at the volatility. And um, all these highly functionalized aromatics, um, they have quite low vapor pressures. And so the distribution of volatilities for the low temperature pyrolysis extends to much lower values. And we expect especially compounds with a low volatility to be efficient at forming secondary organic aerosol. So, um, um, so the, the VOCs that you get from a, from a fire that's, uh, that's, that's smoldering basically are expected to be more efficient at forming SOA. I'm almost done, but I wanted to show one more thing. Um, so a lot of this work has been driven by, um, by progress in, uh, in, in, in peak finning software, in mass spectrometers. And so I just wanted to show um, <clears throat> that this instrument development it has not stopped. In fact, it's, it's continued at a very rapid pace. And so last summer, we were fortunate um, to, to work with Toughwork and Aerodyne uh, on a new prototype uh, instrument for protein transfer reaction mass spectrometry. Um, that's, that's, really, um, that's really a very interesting option. Um, so what this instrument does is um, it has a drift tube where the um, protein transfer chemistry between H2O plus and VOCs take place. But what the software engineers have done is add quadrupole rods around the reactor and the RF field from the quadrupole rods focus the ions as the, as the, the ions travel down with the tube. And this gives uh, 10 to 100 times more ions than in the conventional design. So that translates into better detection limits. And an illustration of that is given in this plot where the measurements for toluene, C8 aromatics, C9 aromatics, and C10 aromatics are compared between the, um, the NOAA SIMS that, I, that we used for the fire experiments and this new uh, VOCUS PTR TOF. And especially here for the C10 aromatics where the, the mixing ratios are in the tens of PPT range, you can see that the, that the uh, old instrument, it's, it's three years old, um, has uh, some noise. And the new instrument um, has a much better precision. The new instrument's also coupled to um, a longer time of flight tube. And so you get a much better time uh, mass resolution. So this is um, one peak, one nominal mass at 163. AMU uh, analyzed with both instruments. And the difference in mass resolution is pretty clear. Um, so this is work led by uh, Felipe Lopez-Hilfiger at Toughwork uh, 
and uh, Jordan Kreckmer at Aerodyne and Abby Koss, uh, who was my graduate student at CU, uh, both played a large role in, in, uh, in, in doing these uh, characterization experiments. So we're fortunate to get one of these uh, in our lab in CU, and that's going to hopefully lead to the next steps in this research. So with that, um, I'll conclude, leave some time for questions. Um, and, but just in summary, we looked at VOC chemistry in LA. Um, I showed that you can, you can get the composition of emissions after accounting for chemical removal and formation. Um, evaluated that analysis using WARF-CAM. And then summarized Brian's work, who's shown that, um, that these emissions that you get um, um, are consistent with a large contribution from, from volatile chemical products. Um, and those volatile chemical products are important for OH reactivity and SOA formation. And then the second part of my talk, I characterized biomass, biomass burning emissions, uh, showed that you can explain a lot of that using um, a combination of high and low temperature pyrolysis processes and significantly the low temperature pyrolysis products may be more efficient in forming secondary organic aerosol. So that's it. Uh, all of these people uh, contributed in major ways to this work and, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Excellent talk, Dios. Thanks very much. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. And since there's people viewing online, we'd like to use the microphone. So um, any questions? I have a couple, but I'll let the other people talk first. Hey, yes, great talk. <clears throat> I just wonder if you could clarify what you said about the propanol, which seemed like it was horizontal there, but... <clears throat> propanol. Was that pro oh, it was propanol, was it? Yeah. Oh, not propanol. Yeah. Okay. No, ah. the, pro the propanol shows strong formation. That does show yeah. the up and yeah. down. Yeah, okay. But, yeah. but none of the alcohols show formation. They all show a slight decline with OH, um, but also a lot of scatter, and probably that's because they, they're not from motor vehicles, but they're more from... Uh, from chemical products, uh, and, and the sources yeah. are not as correlated. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. missed that. Thanks. Yeah. So my question, you were talking about the consumer products and um, comparing the production of them relative to oil, natural gas, and diesel, and then, then you went into some ventilation system uh, to, I guess, predict how much actually gets out into the atmosphere, um, and I was, and, and some, and somehow, I guess, maybe I didn't make the final connection. Does that make sense? It does. Um, so, in Brian's inventory, he looks at um, um, production numbers. He looks at emission factors, so how much VOC is released if you use a uh, kilogram of cleaner on the floor of this, this floor. Um, but it doesn't, the emission factors are about the emissions in this room. So it doesn't mean that everything makes it out of the building. Uh, so Brian tried to account for that in his paper, but, but found that a lot of the data is just, it's just, it's just not there. I mean, there are some papers, but it wasn't enough to really rigorously account for it. So this is where our building measurements come in, and um, and we're, we're also not there yet, but I think we have the tools to, down the road, really get, get a handle on, okay, if you, le if you release a compound um, in, in a building that has these chemical properties, you know, um, half of it will, will vent out to the atmosphere, and the other half will just get lost permanently on, on walls. Um, yeah. Like lactic acid. Like lactic acid, yeah. Yeah, and, and one thing that can also play a role there is chemistry. So 
if you have uh, a molecule with unsaturated bonds that, that gets deposited on a surface, um, there is a lot of ozone that gets mixed into buildings, um, and that can react with these reactive surfaces then. So then the chemistry may prohibit um, the, the VUC to come out of the building. Yeah. More questions? So Yost, I'm aware of the Sloan Foundation and their work on, on indoor air quality. And every time I hear a talk from that research, I get like cringe because you kind of <laughs> figure out how what's going on indoors. And I'm just curious of the work coming out of that, how much of that is seeming to be that there might be some pretty big health impacts from the indoor air quality on that, because typically right now indoor air quality focuses on biomass burning inside for cooking, um, yes. rather than yes, yeah, the type of building we're in. Yeah, um, yeah, the program really focuses on uh, on sort of western indoor air pollution, um, as opposed to indoor cooking in uh, in developing nations, and and that's a choice that you can agree or disagree with, but that's just that's just the way it's done. Um, one thing that's been really eye-opening is um, even if you release just a minuscule amount of stuff indoors, how high up the, the um, concentrations build. So what I didn't show was uh, after the reception, um, the opening of the exhibit was over. They, they cleaned up, and there was methanol in the cleaner. Um, and. Uh, there was a, a spike of a PPM of methanol in the whole building that lasted several hours, and it mixed out perfectly exponentially out of the building. But uh, you know, I mean, it was just just a small amount of cleaner, and it gives you a PPM. Uh, that doesn't answer your question, but it is kind of um, an eye-opening fact that uh, things build up very quickly, and um, yeah, something that outside may never build up to levels that, that you worry about uh, indoors can definitely do that. Yeah. And it's an interesting question too moving forward as, as, as climate change and energy um, efficiency will change the way buildings are put together. You know, the buildings are getting more and more sealed up and, uh, and this, this may become more of an issue. <coughs> So I'll ask my second question. Um, when you were comparing the inputs to the analysis, um, and then you compared to what you predicted were the inputs based on the Worf Chem analysis, the um, the values that you showed were all relative to CO. Yeah. And so my question is: is what were those estimates, or uh, and, you know, those those th that comparison between the the Calnex data and the Wharf Chem analysis, were they constrained by the CO measurements that were done during the same time period? It's all modeling work. Um, <clears throat> so these are the um, emission ratios for CO. You're right um, that are used in Wharf Chem on the one hand and that I got from the model output on the other hand. Um, so of course, between emissions going into a model and concentrations coming out of the model, there's transport and chemistry in between. And so the test is, does the analysis account for, for all of that? Um, one wrinkle here is that the CO emission inventory um, was from Brian McDonald. It's a fuel-based inventory that we think is very accurate. Um, the VUC emission inventory is, um, in this case, it's the NEI emission inventory. And um, they're not the same inventory, right? So the inventory, in the inventory, the VUCs and CO, CO don't correlate as well as they do in the measurements, for instance. So, so that's a wrinkle that we ran into here. Um, the diurnal variations of CO in the inventory uh, were different from the diurnal variations of VOCs in the inventory. Um, and so um, we had to, we ran into a lot of sort of secondary issues that, that were very interesting and that I just didn't have time to talk about here. 
Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, definitely shows that it's very complex. It, oh, it is. It is. Yeah. It seemed like a simple ID, but uh, you know, devils in the details. Yes, it always is. How does EPA handle the um, the additional the chemical component that you talked about? In other words, I mean, they have these big emission inventories, and it's in the I don't know what's in the NEI. I can't remember, but I remember looking back at some old emission inventories from EPA, and they seem to have pretty substantial solvent component and things like this. How does that compare with some of the stuff that you guys have? Yeah. Found? They do, um, and especially CARP, um, who, who were important in the study, have a very detailed uh, inventory for um, what they call solvents. Um, so it had not been uh, evaluated using top-down measurements yet. Um, so the first thing that Brian tried was, was uh, take that inventory and see how well it does for these measurements. And, and it, it, it explained some of the discrepancies, but, but he found uh, there were still discrepancies. And he also found you had to scale that inventory quite, quite a bit. So then he decided, OK, I need to do a better job and, and, uh, and, and look into this harder. Um, so yes, they, they, they have not been ignored, these emission inventories. Um, they haven't been evaluated. And, and I will say, um, we've done a lot of VUC um, emissions work. Um, and, and a lot of the inventories are, are quite a bit off. So, so, it needs to, so they need to be evaluated. And, uh, and uh, yeah. I think half the uh, audience was on my closing slide, so <laughs> they know better what's in here than I do. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Yost again. Thank you.